As you can see here, there's been a lot of uh, studies on, on humans, and especially on human volunteers for the past 10 years. Here is the list of, of all the, the studies that, that uh, we, we could find. Uh, and so I won't go through all of them, of course, but I'm going to highlight at least four of, of them uh, pretty soon. Uh, and, and then we'll, we'll discuss the results. So um, the first study here, here was performed in uh, South Korea. Uh, and they were using a 250 kilohertz neurostimulation. This was a cortical stimulation, so in the outer part of the, of the skull. They were using pushed sonication. Actually, all those studies on humans were using pushed sonications. And what, what they were doing is that as they were targeting the somatosensory cortex, they were able to induce sensations in the hands. And you see here the location where the, the, the volunteers reported sensations in the hands. Uh, and uh, so you, you can see that almost all of them reported hand sensations. So this is a very important result because again, so they did not send ultrasound into the hand, but they sent ultrasound in the brain, in the somatosensory cortex. Only one was not responsive. And actually retrospective analysis, I mean, this patient had a very thick skull so they believe that maybe as they use the same power for all the, 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 the volunteers, maybe the power was not high enough for this volunteer because the skull was reflecting too much and attenuating, attenuating too much the, um, the ultrasound. Nevertheless, this was quantitative, uh, qualitative uh, results and not quantitative. So other studies tried to extract some quantitative information. Um, this is another study, again, in the somatosensory cortex, using this time a 500 uh, uh, kilohertz neurostimulation. Setup is a little bit more complicated. So what, what they were doing here is that they would attach to the wrist uh, some uh, pins in, in order to induce sensations in the hands, in the nerves. And they were targeting S1 in the somatosensory cortex in order to change the sensations that were induced by those pins. And they were at the same time recording the EEG and they would see how the EEG would change when they apply ultrasound and why they don't, while they always induce those hand sensations. Uh, and you see here, uh, blue is sham, red is uh, focused ultrasound, and those gray areas are the areas that are statistically different. Uh, and you see that actually the, the change are, are, are very small uh, and in order to be uh, statistically relevant, you see for example here it is in this area they differ but not significantly. So it was the first attempt. We see some fluctuations but it's very small change in the EEG recordings in, in, in that case. So those two were superficial. Let's move to other studies where again, pulse sonication was were performed, but this time deep into the brain, here you see in the right and left thalamus. And what they did is that again, uh, this is Legon's group, and they used also pins here in, in the hands, and they would use uh, one or two pins in order to induce tactile sensations, and they would ask the patient, so do you feel two pins or one pin? How many pins do you feel? and they would look at the, the reaction and the tactile assessment that the, the, um, uh, the volunteers would do. And at the same time, again, in order to quantify, they also recorded the EEG while doing those tactile sensations and either doing sham sonication or actually sonicating ultrasound in the thalamus. And you see here, so blue is the sham sonication, red is with ultrasound. So again, you see that there's only a very slight difference between the two. Uh, so they look at the Fourier transform of those signals in order to see in, in, in frequency, there was some, some change. So again, by looking at both Fourier transform with the, uh, the sham here or the ultrasound sonication, well, with your eye, you might not be able to see a difference, but there is actually some when they plot the difference between the two. 
so again, there is some effect of the ultrasound, uh, but it's not drastic for sure. So it's hard to make sure that this is a strong target engagement. There is some modifications, but not very strong. Last experiment here is uh, with a slightly higher frequency, 650, and this was in the right anterior thalamus. You see here, these are, these are the sonication sites among all the, the volunteers, and you see here the, the positioning of the transducer in the patient. And in this example that was MR guided, uh, they, they were measuring the threshold uh, to a, a thermal stimulus, and you see here Thermal stimulus was uh, induced here in the forearm of the volunteers, so they would increase the temperature until they would first see some, some sensory threshold. So do they feel something? And then do they feel some pain? And what is the maximum tolerance? And, uh, and they look at the, the difference in threshold by, again, either doing sham stimulation in the thalamus or doing active stimulation in the thalamus. And, and you see here that between sham and active, uh, only one was significantly different, uh, which is the pain threshold. But the difference is, is very, very, very small. I mean, it, if you look at that, it's, it's 0.5 degrees in, in the, uh, the threshold that they estimate to be, uh, to be painful. Um, so it's, those studies are great at least to assess the safety of modulating the brain with ultrasound, but the efficacy um, was kind of <laughs> disappointing. The effect were, were quite small. One possible reason for that is that all those studies that are listed here were performed without any aberration correction. And we know that uh, with the skull in place, I mean, this is human skulls, this is not rodent skulls or, or monkey skulls. So there is some aberrations. And here is uh, a retrospective a study that we, we performed in, in our lab based on, on the, um, the description of the setup in, in this uh, study on, uh, on uh, humans by Brinker et al. And you see that actually they did not refocus the beam very precisely here. And the, the focus was even splitted into three different lobes. Uh, and same thing for this other study here published the same year, 2020, uh, you see that there is no precise focusing in the skull, again, because there is no aberration correction. We can look also at transverse planes, and you see here the difference between the intended target, this was the initial target in red, and the actual refocusing, maximum pressure allocation is, is here. So there's a, quite a, a gap between the two here. It's, it's shifted away, this is only on, on the edge of the of the initial target. And here it's even worse. You see that actually the m main focusing is almost completely outside the intended target. So this might explain why. The good thing is that it's safe, but, but it was not as, effic as efficient as one could hope. And we already saw before that without any aberration correction, this is what you would expect, actually, a, a, a smear focusing. Whereas with aberration correction, you can refocus at the right location, have a tight focus, and especially a controlled focus. You already know exactly where the ultrasound beam is, is going to. And we know that there already exist such systems able to correct for the aberrations. Those were in, in, developed for essential tremor uh, treatments. And those were discussed by Jeff Elias in uh, course one of this MOOC. And this is the exablate neurosystem from uh, Insitech. Uh, here is an example of a, a patient suffering from essential tremor. And uh, so this is the uh, exablate neurosystem, the one that is um, actually uh, installed in, uh, in, in Paris at La Pitié Salpêtrière Hospital, where we treated patients as well, following the, the protocol that was developed by, by Jeff Elias. And you see here uh, a lesion that, that, that one can induce deep in the brain, and you see the location of the lesion is, is very precise. We double check everything, and we compensate the aberration for that. And thanks to this lesion, we, and Jeff, 
and other teams in the world are able to treat essential tremor and you see the end result here. This is after thermal ablation. This is the date of the treatment. The patient was asked to uh, write the date before the treatment. This is after the treatment. You see that there's quite an improvement of the tremor. But this is by inducing a thermal lesion. So this is a permanent lesion. Uh, what we wanted to do is use this system at a very low power and not ablate tissues, but modulate the activity of tissues in this location. So here is the, the overall setup. You, you already saw it. So the uh, InsightEc Exablate Neuro workstation is in the control room. And uh, there is a neurologist in the, uh, in the magnet room, which is asking the patient, for example, to hold the posture in order to be able to assess. Because what we did is that we attached accelerometers at the hands of the patient in order to be able to quantify the tremor during the treatment. Because, of course, we know that when we perform ablation, the tremor stops. So there is a significant decrease in the tremor. We can easily see it. But for all the past work that was done on neuromodulation, the effect was very mild. So we needed to be able to monitor continuously to see, we were hoping to see a slight change in, in tremor, let's say 5 to 10 percent. So you see here we were able to record during the sonications the shaking of the patients. So let's start with the real treatment, I would say the thermal treatment. You see here, so during, for a thermal treatment we use high energy, 20,000 joules. And with the first sonication, you see this is the, the tremor power before sonication. And you see that after sonication, it decreases significantly. It's, uh, it's almost 90% reduction of the tremor. And the maximum temperature was 51 degrees. So we decrease the tremor, but it's not permanent. Five minutes later, when we treat again, we see that the tremor is back. And this time it decreases again by more than 90% and we reach the temperature here of 95 uh, 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 degrees, uh, uh, 59 degrees, sorry. 59 degrees is a permanent lesioning. And you, you see now that five minutes later and 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, that the tremor is gone. And the tremor is completely gone this time. Patient is treated. So, before achieving high power and, and achieving a lesion, we took advantage of the fact that we were increasing slowly the power. And we took advantage of the very early stage of the treatment when we aligned, when we just verified the position of the trend with, with a, one, a few degrees temperature elevation. Once we are done with the alignment, we would switch to pulse sonication in order to be able to test if one can modulate the activity deep into the brain with focused ultrasound. So we use pulse sonication, so much less energy, not 20,000 joules, but 8 joules. And with 8 joules, uh, we were kind of hoping to <laughs> induce a 5% decrease, but actually what we measured is not a 5% decrease, it was an 80, uh, a 98% decrease. So the tremor was, was basically gone and it was gone for 30 minutes. Second patient, we did the same, but this time we recorded the decrease. So this is before sonication, after sonication. And you see very similar to the result that we obtained on monkeys. This time the effect does not last for a few seconds, but it lasts for almost 30 minutes. So with the monkeys, it was 20 minutes and now it was 30 minutes. 30 minutes and as soon as the tremor was, was back enough that we could quantify, we treated the patient. Um, so of course, for the patient, this is the most important result. The most important result for him is that he was treated. The most important result for us is that we were able with only very little energy to induce more than a significant drop. I mean, we could almost suppress the tremor for 30 minutes. We know this is not permanent, but this is a first step. And this is just a way to uh, at least make sure that we can induce a strong target engagement 
with low intensity focused ultrasound. This is mind blowing. Uh, uh, it was mind blowing to us. At the same time, almost uh, another team at West Virginia University, Rockefeller Center, uh, they used the same device to exablate neuro, not to modulate the VIM in the thalamus, but the nucleus accumbens um, for addiction, for treating addiction. So what they would do is that they, they used addict patients and they displayed either pictures of opioids or cocaine or alcohol and they look at the, how the, the patient reacts and they, they score the craving. And what they did is that they, they first uh, scored the, um, the, the craving with um, sham sonications. So you are given amount of craving for this patient, especially, was especially craving for alcohol. And this is with, after sonication is a left nucleus accumbens. You see a drop, I mean, it's, it's very impressive because this, I mean, if you look at that, it, it just drops down to zero. There is no craving at all for this patient. And they, then they targeted also the right nucleus accumbens. And you see that a few minutes after the sonication, it is still, the craving is still very low. Second patient, again, uh, sham uh, sonications here, and then sonication in the left nucleus accumbens, and then the right nucleus accumbens, and again, craving goes down to, look at that, zero. There is no craving at all. So this is very promising for translating those techniques to the clinics. Uh, this is just the first step. <coughs> and of course, uh, the only thing, the drawback of this is that this machine here is fantastic to test neuromodulation, but it's, it's very expensive. Uh, it, it's a few million euros. Uh, let's say it's at least 1.5 million for the ultrasound, 1.5 million for the MR, so it's quite expensive. It's quite expensive and, and we have to look for ways to decrease the cost of those machines in order to, to compete with, for example, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is uh, two orders of magnitude cheaper than uh, such, uh, such systems. Uh, and so that's what we're going to, to see in the third part, how to develop new devices that are efficient to compensate the aberration of the skull, but with a much lower cost.